Good morning, Marian. Thank you to be with us today for MPW Fortune Italia. Thank you for having me. Maria Salsan, Senior Vice President, Global Communication, Philip Morris International. As you know, in this section, uh, a room all to yourself, uh, we talk about special women, the stories of special women, and you are one of that. Um, yeah. You are recognized, you are recognized like one of the most bravo women that feel the changing and the new tendencies before before they became mainstream so the the first first question is uh, where we are today what is the situation today is not easy but uh, please uh, let us uh, your your opinion we're in a crazy time today it's utterly chaotic i think it's very unpredictable I think we are living at the whim of the latest news update as it might relate to COVID-19, um, variants of COVID-19. We're living in a world where the impact of climate change seems to result in extreme weather reports. Every time I flick on a news or a news reporting service, um, there's a flood, there's a fire, there's global warming, there's global cooling. Um, we're living in a time where inclusion and diversity are more important than ever before, but we're much, much more aware of the fundamental inequities of all of our societies. So it's a period of huge change. I mean, one of the things I've gone back in the last four months and really spent time trying to understand is 1968. What can I learn from 1968 that might create parallelisms? Look, there's a natural inclination to go back and look at the Spanish flu but I think it was a different time. It wasn't a time when science and technology could come up with solutions or possible solutions almost instantly. And when I say instantly over a year and a year and a half, um, but we're at a time where I think people feel very out of control. They feel very much um, vulnerable. They're buckling down and focusing on their families, on their livelihoods on a way to go forward in a very, very unpredictable world. So Marian, you say that the world is changed, totally changed, and now we have to learn to live in a, in a new normal, a new normal way. That's it, very that we have to do? Yeah, it's a very much a new normal way. I mean, uh, I feel some days very sad. I started my career 35 years ago in a world that was so social. Um, you went to work and you had a coffee and you worked as a team and you condensed lots of people into a small room to think through an idea. And I never once heard the phrase, you're on mute. And today I feel like um, good collaborations are largely um, happening through a screen. They're computer mediated. I'm someone who had the luxury of an international career. So I was on an airplane God knows, at least twice every month, normally to a foreign country. The last 18 months, 19 months, I've had to go only between Switzerland and the US, the only two countries in which I'm legal to live in. And so much of the beauty of the learning that used to be very tactical, I would go someplace, I would see it, I would hear it, I would eat it. Um, these things are now missing. And we're creating a very, very different normal where the screen is both um, an expediter, but it's also a barrier. You don't get that same, I, I keep feeling like it's in my fingers, but I really miss that sort of intellectual hug, that physical hug, um, that ability to share a sandwich with someone at lunchtime, you know, to go for the wine after work. So all of those things that always made us humane We've had to figure out how to do in a computer mediated environment. And it's really tough and it's even more tough just because of all the other pressures we feel. We're suffering from a mental health standpoint. We don't know how to create new barriers between life and work. Our lives feel like they've been on upheaval. Many of us have family members that are also working from home with us. Uh, many of us have never spent this amount of time with our own families in our entire working lives because it's just different. You're mostly doing things from home. 
Marian, about about your career, your work and your life. You 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 work in a prestigious work in communication before Philip Morris, uh, Porter Novelli, JW Worldwide Havas, Havas uh, uh, Creative. Could you tell us uh, and for the young women how did you start and what has been the step the most important step in your career? So I started as a baby in the business the way everyone did. I was really, really lucky that in the early 1990s, I discovered this thing. Then it was called online services. It was called, I guess it was called the internet. We didn't even quite understand what the internet could be. But I was able to learn those tools, learn a different style of talking with my fingers, of type talking. I learned to do market research um, by asking people questions through instant message, by holding online focus groups, by discovering the things that people might not tell you if they had to look you in the eye because the answer was too embarrassing. And I uh, leveraged all of that curiosity. I mean, if there's two things that define me and my career, I would say it was fearlessness and curiosity. Fearlessness, because my generation of women, there weren't huge expectations on us that we had to be uber successful. And as a consequence, I never worried about failing because I already felt like, well, wait, hang on, I have a cool job. If I don't keep this cool job, I'll, I'll, I'll find another one. So fearlessness, um, and it was also fearlessness about becoming global in 1986, when I was just a baby, they said to me, do you want to go work on... Um, a merger and acquisition transaction in the UK. And I went off and I spent several months in the UK working on the deal that ultimately created Vodafone. Um, a few years later, um, I launched the first online market research company. And then my then boss, Jay Shiat, said to me, will you understand these online services? AOL is going to launch in Europe. Are you willing to go? I had a golden retriever puppy. So I didn't want to put my dog into quarantine. So I decided to go to the Netherlands. It was an extraordinary time to be in Northern Europe because I was part of a society where it went really from zero internet penetration to 30 or 40% penetration very, very quickly with the introduction of high-speed internet. And um, I was always curious. I was a student besides being first an employee and then an executive. I was constantly learning, constantly studying. Even during COVID, I did something completely crazy. I applied to was an ex and was accepted at and began a master's degree in government at Johns Hopkins using only online schooling. So I've gone back to school yet again at this very old age um, because learning is so much part of my uh, personal DNA that I felt like all the free time I had, I have this obligation to myself to get better and to understand just how much I didn't know and the other reason for going back to studying government has been how much things have changed. I mean, what I learned at Brown in the late 70s and early 80s, so many of these things are completely different now. So I had to go back and relearn race and ethnicity. I had to go back and relearn the, um, the way we interpret today um, international relations. So it's been, it's been spectacular, but um, it's very much a function, I think, think of just being curious and being fearless. I have no fear of failing. I assume I'm going to fail three times a day. I'm going to go home in the evening or now that I'm working from home, I'm going to go to crawl under my duvet and feel sorry for myself for an hour. And then I'm going to get back up and keep doing it. Marian, you, you tell about uh, um, um, study, curiosity, courage, brave, and uh, consciousness to be. When did you have the, the 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 awareness of your own value when you get this in your mind oh it's okay i'm ready no i think it's something different i'm a huge beneficiary of being female and coming of age in the 70s when in the u.s there was suddenly this openness to women having a place at the table um and if you had the right education you were welcomed because in the early days of inclusion and diversity, they just needed to get women at the table. So I think I was given an extraordinary number of very unique opportunities because I had the academic training for somebody to take a risk on me and probably I had the interpersonal style that made me um, 
easy to work with for a bunch of guys that up till then had been very much in male dominated areas. And with the arrival of women, you had to really learn how to come in, be one of the guys, but without compromising either your femininity, your femininity or your own personal values. And I was just very lucky. I've had phenomenal bosses. My bosses have had phenomenal bosses. I've never been afraid to speak up and I've never been afraid to admit I'm wrong. You reach my curiosity if being woman has been a plus or some time an obstacle. Oh, it's both. And I, I mean, um, especially in the early days, being a woman was a blessing. I would be the first one to say I was oftentimes given roles, responsibilities, specific tasks to do a year or two ahead of when I was really qualified to take on the challenge because they needed to have women at that table. And I was sadly um, the least defected of options, meaning I was there, I was educated, I was willing to try anything, I was willing to take home 10 hours of homework every night in order to be prepared for the next morning. I think as I've become more and more successful and risen through the corporate ranks, now I've begun to see that a lot of what I put up with in terms of microaggressions, um, in terms of subtle discrimination, I just thought that was normal. Um, it was a product of how and when I grew up. I didn't necessarily expect total equality So I wasn't as incensed when I was treated slightly less equal. Um, and in many ways, it forced me to learn skills and build relationships, for example, with women who were in the support staff hierarchies. Um, oftentimes, they would become my friends because they were the only other women in the area. And it was something that that's sort of made me me in terms of being very non-hierarchical, but at the same time being very decisive. I really was given access to both the best of the female and the best of the male opportunities. I've also worked for some extraordinary men and women over this time whose behaviors I can cherry pick, meaning I've never met one person I want to be just like them, but I've seen characteristics in all the people I've worked for and with And I say, well, if I want to improve, I need to be like this person in terms of um, decisive. I want to be like this person in terms of being analytical. And then another piece of it that I think is a little bit more female, I also know what I'm not good at. And I would never put myself voluntarily into a place where I'm going to fall off a glass cliff. So I've never looked for a job, for example, on the finance team. Uh, because taking a job on the finance team would be a disaster. <laughs> I've, I've always stayed in that realm of communications, of insights, of marketing, uh, of people development. And I've always shied away from manufacturing and supply chain and things that I just don't have a natural aptitude for. I, I think one of the things that is the luxury of being female is I knew my limitations and I just played to my strengths. Marian, about, about, about gender, in 2003, uh, if I don't miss, I, uh, you introduced a, a, a neologism, metrosexual, uh, one of your goal, international goal all over the world. And then in 2019, uh, you defined chaos a new normal. Now in, in, in a fluid gender and In a, in a mix of situation, female, male, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in which direction we are going about gender? So I think it's a very tricky question because um, the world globally is still a male world um, with a lot of female influence. Um, and we are just at the tipping point where we're moving towards equality But I think the important obligation those of us who have succeeded have is to ensure that young women have the confidence to make the mistakes it's going to take them to be able to develop a more strategic decision-making style and to also know how to project themselves in a male-dominated room. I still attend meetings today, which might be 20 men and three women, and I have to be very, very sure that I'm always prepared. I mean, there is no room 
in this chaotic world, in a world where men are actually starting to feel threatened that because of inclusion and diversity, their um, guarantee of world domination is now under scrutiny. I, I think that we, we're, we're in a different place now and I think that we need to be very, very empathetic to both genders and how do they find satisfaction and happiness, intellectual and personal reward from their work. And this is also my sensation that the new generation are less interesting to gender, male, female, but is not so important for them, I think. You know what? It, it isn't. And in the early stages of career, I think we're all humans. I think there's more understanding of the inequities um, of the need to create um, support systems for people who are members of the LBGT community, for people who are not um, who are not Caucasian. I think that there's a lot of other balancing acts beyond just male female that we need to be very sensitive to. Oh, arriving to the to 2018. You move from Switzerland to lead the Philip Morris Global Communication uh, with a hard challenge, try to build a no smoking land, a no smoking future. It's, uh, it's like an impossible challenge working for Philip Morris. How do you are? Where is the point now? <laughs> it, it, look, it, it is the hardest challenge I ever faced. Part of taking it on is probably an expression of my a fearlessness and also my pragmatism. I realized I was at the end of my career. Um, there were no kids in my house that were going to high school any longer. I had to face other parents or other members of the community that could judge me. I am a never smoker, so I have a good story. And I talked to Philip Morris from the summer of 2017 until I joined um, very early 19, sorry, 2018. And they really persuaded me of um, their global commitment to harm reduction, to tobacco harm reduction. And I had this belief that maybe I could get people to become never smokers, young people, or to get people who were current legal age smokers to make a switch by taking the skills that I had from working in all kinds of businesses, from tech to fashion, to cosmetics, to you know, uh, government, and I could put those skills to work and actually get people to quit smoking. So if you think about the Unsmoke campaign we launched about a year after I arrived, it has a very, very important triplet. If you don't smoke, don't start. If you smoke, quit. If you won't, then change to a better, to a better product. Um, for me, it's the challenge of a lifetime, but I feel like I was equipped to take on the challenge because I'd had a lifetime of such extraordinary experiences. I felt that I had thick enough skin, but look, some days it hurts. Like when I'm invited to a conference and then a week later they call back and they say, we're getting a lot of social pressure. We need to cancel you. It's hurtful. I mean, because these are the same conferences. If I was still at Havas, believe me, they would be sending me all kinds of letters pleading with me to please attend. So there, there's, there's a level of hurtfulness. There's a level of hate that I encounter. I mean, there are the threats that I live with, but I so fundamentally believe that what Philip Morris is doing in its transformation, in changing, in trying to build a global harm reduction strategy and trying to um, eliminate combustible cigarettes and create viable alternatives I feel like I'm on the good guy side and, and look, others will criticize me for that. I've had to become very sensitive to um, the fact that other people don't necessarily agree with my choice. So therefore the choice was very personal. It was a choice for our family. Um, and not every, I, not everybody could or should make that choice. It, it's, it's a big ask. It really requires me to live inside myself a lot um, to reboot myself a lot. Um, there isn't that external affirmation that I'm used to, let's say with something like metrosexual. Marian, in terms of uh, awareness and uh, sustainability, how much uh, social, social media help to change the world in terms of 
relationship between young generation, Generation Z, uh, social media help to a new idea, idea, a new vision? So constant connectivity is both the greatest gift that we've had in my adult lifetime and also probably one of the most dangerous things. Um, the fact that any time, day or night, I can roll over, pick up my phone. My phone has the computing power stronger than any computer I had in the 80s or 90s. I can find any data source. I can confirm or disqualify that data source by doing fact checking. I can speak to almost anyone by initiating a tweet or initiating an email or initiating a LinkedIn posting. These are all really wonderful things. Um, the problem I have is some of my best learning came from that long conversation the 20 minutes you spent over a coffee and then the 10 minutes you spent wrapping up the conversation in the doorway. And those things don't happen with the same level of intensity or maybe um, depth of sharing when it's all computer mediated. So it's both the greatest thing that's ever happened and it's really tough. And I mean, I, I saw this even with schoolwork where you have you know, how did I learn when I was an undergraduate at Brown? A great deal of it was interacting with my fellow students. How do you do interaction with your fellow students when you're taking a class online? You're in Switzerland. Your professor is somewhere in Washington, D.C. Your classmates are scattered around the globe and you're doing it off message boards. I really had to teach myself a new way of engaging and learning. And so I think this, um, the most important takeaway is uh, we are in a computer mediated, a text driven world for years to come and people need to figure out how to get the best out of it and then how to ignore some of the hyperbolic hate that also exists there. Marian, another part of very important part, the hard part of your life was when you bravely faced to brain cancer. Three, <laughs> three, three. My last one, my last brain tumor was just taken out last match. But you fight, you fight and defeat. You fight very hard. Yeah, you know, it's really funny. I see those brain tumors as a gift because it taught me something that you have to learn in life, which is there are sometimes things that happen that you cannot control. So you hire the very, very best experts. You listen to what those experts advise. You make intelligent choices. And then you put your hands in their, your, or in my case, my head in their hands and you trust um, and you manage and it's just fine. But how the disease change not only your way to think and live, also the way to work and how to train and protect the brain. What is the best way to protect the brain? So for me, it's been feeding my brain more brain food. So I, um, my first tumor was in 2007. The second was, I think, in 2012 or 13. The last one, I was it was discovered in December of 2019. And I just decided I need to get into the best physical shape. I need to get into the best mental shape. I started, that's when I applied to Hopkins to start taking classes because I realized that the brain is very much a muscle that you can train. So I realized instead of slowing my brain down, I needed to push my brain, my brain just like I would if I had um, was training for a marathon. Thank you, Marian, for being with us in this project of Fortune Italia. E grazie per essere stata con noi. E a tutti l'appuntamento è con uno dei prossimi incontri al femminile di Una stanza tutta per sé. Arrivederci.